Hey everyone, welcome to Eric Mattel Investigates the Interviews. My guest today is Ronald Murphy. Ron and I have known each other for a several, several years through our mutual friend, Lon Strickler. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, Ron is one of those guys that's out in the field all the time investigating high strangeness, whether it's Bigfoot, UFOs, ghosts, dogman, or even vampires. So I can't wait to talk with Ron. He is a wealth of information, has several books available. So let's get into it. As promised, ladies and gentlemen, here he is, the one, the only, Ron Murphy. Ron, how you doing, man? I, it's a pleasure being here, my friend. It's been too long. We've talked together. We we know each other's work, but it's been too long since we've actually sat down together. I know. I think it was like, I think we were saying it was almost like two years ago. Something like that. Yes, sir. Yes, that sir. Was like, and I think that was the first time that we ever got a chance to really talk together. And, it was. Uh, and since then, you've been doing some really incredible research. And I was, and I, you know, you know, we're, you're one of those guys like me, we're out in the field, we're boots on the ground investigating, not behind the computer out in the field and sometimes putting ourselves, you know, in harm's way. Mm -hmm. But before we get into a lot of this really cool stuff, because I have got a million questions I want to ask too. I want to, I always like to ask my guests, like, what, do you remember what the, uh, the fire in the belly was like that wanted you to, you know, that you investigated the paranormal or did you have an encounter or an event yeah. That made this happen. What happened? Yeah, I wish I could say that I had an event or, or some sort of encounter, which I did not. Um, and it was through my mother, who was a big fan of the paranormal. And uh, part of our bonding experience growing up as a child was watching, you know, chiller movies together, these chiller theaters on Saturday. Sure. And then we would go out on our own little expeditions and investigate um, claims that people had seen sightings around our area. And, uh, you know, watching, uh, you know, That's Incredible and In Search Of and all that stuff. So definitely I was a child, a product of the 1970s. And uh, this was just, you know, really my fond memories of my mother that was allowing me to be who I was explore the world around me and really allowing me to be inquisitive. And I think that's the most important trait that we as humans can have. Absolutely. And I, I think I remember actually that Chiller Theater. Didn't there, wasn't there like a claymation hand? We go Chiller. It was like. <laughs> well, I was, yeah, I was out of uh, Pittsburgh. So this was yeah. uh, uh, Chili Billy Cardill. And he had like this faux castle type of thing <laughs> where he would come on in. And, you know, basically it was him getting drunk because this was live. So it was basically <laughs> him getting drunk for two hours and showing these, you know, B grade movies. Oh my God, man, that's awesome! Mm -hmm. I mean, we had such great, great times in the '70s. I'm the same way. You're probably about the same age I am. We, mm -hmm. uh, we had that, you know, so many great shows in search of, uh, you know, that's incredible. All these great shows, and uh, you know, and it, it piqued a lot of people's interest in the paranormal. And that's cool that your mom really did you. So that was like a, a really cool experience you had. And it's funny because there's another guy that we know, Art Mack, who's also a Bigfoot researcher, mm -hmm. whose mother would wake him up in the middle of the night, take him out and go UFO hunting. You know, yep. so, yep. you know, I always say that environment is everything, right, Ron? You've got to have a great environment mm -hmm. and those like-minded uh, thoughts. But I'll tell you, man, so, you know, that's really cool. Now, where are we talking to you from tonight? I'm outside. I'm in Western Pennsylvania. Okay. So I'm about 30 miles outside of Pittsburgh and I'm basically in the foothills of the Chestnut Ridge where I do most of my research. Chestnut Ridge. Now the Chestnut Ridge has had so many crazy sightings and activity. Um, you know, I just talked with a colleague of ours, Eric Altman, and, uh, he had just told me about this in, in investigation of Bigfoot. No sooner did they get out of the car, uh, they heard these howls. And then come to find out that you just told me you were on that investigation. I was on that investigation. Yes, sir. And this is like something that I've never experienced before. And that's the reason why my 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 research is now focusing on this particular uh, type of phenomenon, because we were on a good old fashioned Bigfoot expedition, you know, and it was being filmed. So you have to go through really all the all the the bells and whistles because people that watch this on television uh they want to think that this is what happens and it makes good tv so you know the the, the obligatory tree knocks the howls and all that good stuff and it was a fairly quiet night until something started to answer us back you know these very very faint howls 
Uh, it's still, you know, something anecdotal, nothing really, you know, positive uh, about what was going on. But then the strangest thing started to happen, and that was sound. The first time I'd ever heard a sound before in the woods like this. Now, I do know that whenever people have said that they've encountered the Wendigo, that oftentimes they hear a sound or a crash or something like that. But what we were hearing was a sound. Of, it sounded a lot like, um, well, excuse me, excuse like me. <laughs> yeah, it sounded like um, wind chimes. Wow. Uh, it was, yeah, the oddest thing now, now we had talked a little bit before I came on, uh, there's a cemetery uh, in that neighborhood and uh, it's an abandoned cemetery. It's an old time, you know, coal miner cemetery, uh, but there's still a cemetery there. So we assume that there might be um, some sort of decorative, you know, uh, a wind chime down there, but, but nothing. Right. And the wow. nearest house was probably no exaggeration four miles away. We were in a pretty desolate area right here. Wow. Um, and um, so we, we hear the chimes and then um, we start seeing lights. Um, uh, Josh, another investigator, he and I were, were back at what you would call base camp and we had teams scattered throughout the woods and we saw these three lights moving. They looked a little bit like, um, like uh, uh, lanterns, I suppose, mm -hmm. kind of glimmering and everything. And we just assumed that it was people with their cell phones out or whatever walking yeah. and the glimmering was happening, you know, from the, from the bouncing of the walking until they started to rise up as if they were walking up an unseen staircase and they went to the tops of the trees. So now these lights have went from ground level <laughs> up to, you know, 20, 30 feet up in the air. Wow. And um, yeah. And then huh. what happens is they start, for lack of better verbiage, they started to toy with us. It was first as if they were inquisitive, as if they were kind of evaluating who we are or why we were out there. And then after that, it was kind of like a game of uh, of hide and seek or, or you know, whatever, you know, follow the lead or whatever. And um, I started to think back, you know, all the research I've done on, on different types of paranormal phenomenon. And I thought about, you know, in the Middle Ages, people talked about fairies and fairy encounters. And oftentimes they talk about the will of the wisp, these lights mm -hmm. that would lead people out into the middle of nowhere, sometimes in the moors and swamps and such. Oh, right. and people, yeah. So I didn't know what exactly what was going on. I, I, all I can say is after that experience, and I did write a book uh, concerning uh, the worldwide phenomenon of, uh, of these kind of ghost lights and how they related to this particular encounter that I had, trying to put it into some sort of context. And that book will be out um, probably at the end of September. Oh, great. And it's called, yeah, Lights from the Mist is what it's called. And um, But uh, I I'm starting to come to a conclusion uh, as I investigate this stuff that we are dealing with the frequency because even sound is frequency and light is frequency. And um, maybe instead of going out into the woods and looking for Bigfoot and Dogman and, 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 you know, these flying cryptids and all this kind of stuff, is it possible that there is a sentient energy within the world itself and it's allowing us to see something that's not there? Either it's projecting it into us yep. or somehow allowing us to project it onto the world around us. I was, you know what, you just took the words right out of my mouth because it's that's exactly what happened to us in, in two places. In Elkhorn, Wisconsin, when we were investigating the Beast of Bray Road, sure. saw... You know, we heard the howl. We heard this like low guttural scream, growl, yell combination that didn't pitch. You know, definitely not a coyote, not a wolf or a dog, nothing like that. This was just something that was crazy. And yeah, the fear factor was there of like, but it was more like curiosity. Like, what are we hearing? Sure. What happened was what you just said. Dominic said, shine the light over to the corn and see, you know, where we heard the howls, right? So this thing's supposed to be six or seven feet tall here six to seven foot up in the corn we're seeing yellow eye shine like this going wow. back and, forth. and it was it was there i mean something physically was there and although we didn't see the physical thing you know it was there though something was there so what that was one of the things that i was thinking could these creatures because people don't see them you know they're there they can hear them and some see them but could they be coming in and out of some kind of portal could they be coming out of some kind of like energy field or something like that? I've talked to guys, a veteran who was in Vietnam and saw this creature like just appear out of a huge, like bright glowing mass. And there it was. And then it, then it went back inside. 
So I don't know. I mean, there there is definitely research that needs to be done in that frequency range. Right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and if that frequency range can be figured out, at that point, then we might have the key that unlocks so many of these doors that we're searching for. Well, what about, let me ask you this. What about those, we're getting reports of these red pinpoints of light in the woods. Mm -hmm. And for lack of a better term, UFO lights. I mean, right. like you just said, you know, we're getting reports of lights coming down from the trees, coming into the middle of the forest, then boom, going back up again. Mm -hmm. um, okay. could that, is it, could it be gas? Could it be earth? I mean, could it, do you think it could be a earthly phenomenon or do you think it's something completely different? Well, so as I try to connect the dots going back as far as I possibly could go, um, we see that in the Hindu culture, especially in the Hindu religion, they had uh, the belief in something called the prana, which is this kind of enlivening light that the, this world itself is a living being. Mm. And out of that world, we have this little bit of a spark within all of us. You know, that's basically what keeps us alive and interconnects us with all types of uh, living matter. You know, um, I, I think as we connect the dots again, I think that these lights have always been around and they were probably for the most part um, deified or seen as part of a mystical experience. Um, and from that time on, we've had a knowledge of these lights, maybe even to the point that they become an archetype, right? Right. But whenever we now witness these things, then we are kind of falling back in that kind of primal humanity uh, we all share that, but but I, I do believe that these things were always a part of this world, and we had knowledge of this, but as we became more civilized, we kind of stepped out of that frequency, right? That frequency is still there. There's still, there's still the sound. There's still the lights. That's all there. But now we, in the 21st century, and all of our technology, when we step out into the woods, we see it as paranormal rather than being something that's just simply related to the natural world itself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, when we did the, so a week after Elkhorn, mm -hmm. you're, you're making me think of all these different things here because it all correlates into, into one thing. And that one thing is what we're trying to figure out what it is. Um, but the week after we came back from Elkhorn, we went down to the New Jersey Pine Barrens and investigated Bigfoot sightings down there. Same thing. We were in about five miles into the Pine Barrens. And if people know the Pine Barrens, it's nothing but thousands and thousands of acres of just dense forest. So we um, we get down there and we're we're in base camp and Dominic is talking. And I brought Dominic out with me because we wanted to see what the paranormal aspects of this would be. Him being a spirit medium. Mm -hmm. The thought was, since nobody's seeing Bigfoot, could Bigfoot be a ghost? You know, and this this is Eric Spinner had this this idea, but we're sitting at base camp, and 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 this is no offense to any of the Bigfoot researchers, anything like that. Whenever I saw those Bigfoot shows and I heard these guys whooping and hollering, I always thought, is that what they really sound like? <laughs> no, but but I'll be damned if that's not what we heard the night of the investigation. While we're sitting there talking, boom, we hear a whoop in the forest in the woods behind us. I'm like, and then, so Eric had high powered audio. So he puts the audio up. We listen back to it. Sure enough, you could hear the, the, the whoop. So Heather, his wife goes back to answer it back. And they're, they're having a conversation back and forth. And there was nobody down there, Ron. I mean, it was there. We were miles away from anything. So there was nobody down there, but that was the spookiest night, man. But then fast forward to last year, last September, let me, let me see if you if you've had this experience we were down in the bowl again eric wanted to go to a different area but i i we wanted to do this follow-up and it took about a year or so to get there to get back there because we're all busy doing stuff but we finally got back there and eric wanted to go to a different area i said no let's go back to the same area where we had all that activity it's there's got to be something there they had had wildfires recently down there and so we didn't think anything was going to happen but anyway we got down there and we're in base camp and Art, who is, he's kind of now going through some cancer treatments, but to look at him, you wouldn't think anything's wrong with him, but he's taking medications for that. And he's still out in the field, but Art is st is sitting there and he goes, guys, um, I don't know if it's the medications I'm taking or what, but my heart is really racing right now. With that, 
as he says that, we hear a cracked branch behind us. And we see the branch go like this, really like erratic behind us. We flip around. And I saw two yellow eyes about seven feet up just for a split second and then gone. And then you could hear going back into the cedar swamp. And you could hear this, but you couldn't, you know, we couldn't see the physical creature. But there was something there. And oh, we were jumped up that night. I mean, it was crazy because that was usually I'm not like that. I'm pretty, pretty much a, you know, middle of the road kind of guy. But with that, we were all like, whoa, what the hell is this? And then we got zapped. Did you get ever get zapped? We got zapped with all our battery power went down. The uh, the light, uh, the Apple Watch completely got fried. So incredible. Yeah. So I, th you, you're really hitting the nail on the proverbial head here because what is happening is, is so if we're out there investigating UFOs, you can say that that was a UFO experience, uh, you know, a Bigfoot experience, but it all comes from the same kind of gray area. Um, one of the points of contention that I made was that if you were at a religious location, mm. a sacred location, this could be seen as a religious experience, right? An angelic visitation or whatever, because it all is under your perception of what's going on. And that's what makes this all very amazing. But um, again, we are, are dealing with something that seems to be coming from a common source and we have elected to call them Bigfoot, Dogman, you know, UFOs and stuff like that. Whenever it seems to be much more natural than it is. Now, whenever you talk about the zapping and people even feeling this, I've done a lot of research also on infrasound. Again, we're getting back to the idea of frequency. Sure. You know, and infrasound is one of the greatest ways that an animal can stay territorial without being confrontational, right? They can, at a distance, keep us out of their territory. And we know that infrasounds exist, right? Elephants have it, uh, lions and tigers have it. Um, so we know that it exists. So are these, these lights able to produce an infrasound or are these creatures producing an infrasound? Whatever the case may be, there's something, the key out there is much more than looking for footprints or looking for hair on, oh. on fence posts. No, There's something no. much more than this, yeah. And, and I think that once we get to that kind of level, whether it's a quantum level or whatever you want to call it, I think the idea of portals and interdimensionality and possibly even extraterrestrials all kind of come into focus at this point because it's dealing with physics, except it's a physics that's kind of foreign to us yet. You know, we, we, we have... Um, an inkling of what might be out there, but it's never really shown itself fully. Man, that is your, your, you know, when you just said that the, that territorial thing, that's exactly what I felt like in Elkhorn. Like this thing was saying, this is my territory, get out of here. Right. You know? And of course, Ron, we didn't have any protection. We had, we had a flashlight and a radio. That was it. And that was my stupidity, you know, going out there thinking that we would never encounter anything. I didn't think we were going to see anything. You know? Sorry about that. I was kind of call coming in. I used my phone for this, so I had to a, a mute a call real quick. Yeah, no, I think that's something to be said too. But one of the points that I wanted to make as well was um, whenever, like, say we would go back in time. Again, we're in the Middle Ages, right? And um, if we see things that we can't explain, we see lights, but we see, you know, monstrosities, you know, these grotesque shapes, um, then we are dealing again with the world of the fairy because you have something called glamour, you know, that we still have that word today mm. to discuss, you know, makeup and everything. But the idea that an element, and remember, that's where, you know, the whole fairy lore comes from. These are elementals. They are part of the natural world themselves. But are these elements then able to manifest itself into a form mm. that would allow itself to, you know, scare us away or or whatever the case may be. But it's fascinating. And, that, you know, whenever you look at the works of Rene Descartes as well, too, he had this idea of the uh, theater of the mind that, you know, our, our, our brain is pretty much like a blank screen. Mm -hmm. And we are really the director of what we see. Um, you know, we project that kind of reality onto the screen. What happens if in nature there are these forces through some sort of frequency or even bioelectricity of some kind mm -hmm. can somehow influence what we see and hear? At that point, 
people might not be lying whenever they see Bigfoot and Dogman, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's corporeal. It doesn't mean it's tangible. And that's that's even another great mystery that we're dealing with as oh well, my, too. My God. Now, Ron, do you think it's generational? Do you think it could be like, you know, in family lineages? I do. And I've been saying this for years. I think that if somebody has an experience, it's almost as a gift, you know, right. whether it's a good gift or a bad gift. I think in order for this connection to be made, the experiencer and that what is being experienced has to have this kind of unwritten agreement that this is going to happen. And a connection has to be made. And then once everything's flowing that way, then we're allowed to see into that world for whatever reason. You know, why it's allowing us to see it like that, I have no idea. But I think that we people, you know, you talk about generational things, you know, people have been called mediums, they've been called witches, you know, psychics. There's been names, shaman. There have been these names since the very dawn of humanity. But in the end, what we're dealing with is human beings that are capable of interacting with the unseen world around us. Oh, that's amazing. That's very well said. And, uh, you know, in, in our research, that's what I'm thinking is that people are picked to mm -hmm. experience these things, or maybe their antenna is more attuned to mm -hmm. these experiences than the average person. Because you know how it is. You could be out on, a, on an investigation, somebody's seeing a UFO, but you don't see it, or they the other oh. person doesn't see it. You see it, but they don't see it. So there's that, you know, there, and then they're doing some uh, experiments. Do you know about the experiments they're doing now with light spectrum? With oh, the, I, I, I try to keep up on all yeah, that stuff. Sure. It's amazing, man. And that's yeah. why night with night vision, you see a lot more with that night vision yeah. mode because there's somehow, I don't know, and I'm not a scientist, but there's some way of like get, getting through that veil that uh -huh. we're able to see things a little bit better. Absolutely. And I think that every now and then that veil becomes so thin for whatever reason, we're allowed to either see through it or possibly even step into it. I think that can happen. And I'm also intrigued because a few years ago, I wrote a book um, on vampires, as a matter of fact, and Jonathan wow. Downs for the uh, you know Center for Fortean Zoology published it. And um, I am so intrigued by the vampire mythology that, uh, you know, hopefully I get to come out there to that uh, that uh, museum one of these days. The so. Vampire Museum. Well, when you come out for the for the uh, convention next year, which we got the Bucks County Paranormal Convention happening um, March 9th, you're going to be there. Uh, maybe we'll take a run over and uh, to the museum because it is incredible. And, you know, the the idea is everybody thinks Dracula, you know, is is. But Dracula was a movie character. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole vampire lore is a whole completely different thing. And, you know, in Pennsylvania, right up there in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, they have the so-called vampires mausoleum up there where supposedly a vampire uh, existed in the late 1800s. Really? I yeah. didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, can't, and we then, have to take a road trip. Yeah, and another interesting one, too, is in Lynch, Kentucky, of all places, there is a great local folklore about a vampire that existed there in the 1920s. Wow. Yeah. So we might have to do some road trip in the summer. In my book, I try to find one of the first instances of, of what you would call vampirism. And I it led me down this rabbit hole to a place called Goes Cave in Cheddar Gorge in England. Now, this is where they make cheddar cheese. But uh, whenever uh, there was an archaeological investigation into that area, and this is going back about 14,000 years ago, right at the end of the Ice Age, mm -hmm. uh, they found a place where animals were processed. And in that processing area was also the bones of two, three individuals as well, too. And uh, they were just simply devoured. But what makes this a vampiric experience is that they found two skulls that were in the shape of a goblet. And inside that, those skulls was residue of human blood. So there was definitely blood drinking going on as well, too. Wow. And that's going back right to the end of the Ice Age. That's right whenever we are starting to form as a civilized human being, you know? And so it's interesting because they have always been there uh, to haunt our nightmares and they were hunting out of a cave. So think about that as well too, the connection with bats and the connection with the underworld and everything like that. So- Oh my God. What, what's the next event you're gonna be at? 
the 19th, 20th, and 21st at the end of uh, of September. Uh, we will be in Derry, Pennsylvania, which is right at the foothills of the Chestnut Ridge, yeah. has a long history of Bigfoot and UFO sighting, and they will have their first ever uh, Bigfoot festival there. And I'm really excited because these are places that I investigated as a kid. These are places where I used to live. So I'm, it's really, it feels really good to go back home and, you know, and, and talk about what experiences I had in and around that area to show us, you know, that there's more than meets the eye that's out there. Oh man, what a pleasure talking to you, man. I mean, this I'm is sorry. great. And Ron, uh, we'll have to, we're going to have to do part two and we'll have to do part two, uh, like in person because, you yeah. know, you know, we'll go on site somewhere. You're not that far from me. So that's, you I'm know, not, that's right. That's, that's right. Great. Yeah. I'm not that far. We could even meet up in Erie sometime. No worries. That would be crazy, man. That would yeah. be wild. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's incredible. So there's a million stories to be told. And that's again, that why I do this too, is because people have no clue sometimes what's in their own backyard, right? That's right. That's they right. pass, they pass by these beautiful places, but with these great histories every day. You know, and that's why we tell the stories. Thank you so much for being here. Listen, when you're out in the field, be safe, okay? Uh, and you too, my friend. And we will get together and we'll do, we'll do an expedition together. And no doubt we will. Absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, you heard it right here. But listen, thank you so much for listening to, and watching us tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We got a lot more great guests coming up. So thank you so much for watching. Have a great night.